the wonder our redemption's glory now is the time for strength to rise shake off the failure we are moving forward now is the time for strength to says in all of my life in every season I have no such thing to do but worship Jesus Christ our Savior right now in this church Lord we worship you I pray that you do put your hand on the technical difficulties that we're dealing with Lord but in all in all we worship you thank you for saving us thank you for being here with us in Jesus name
emptied again the seed I've received I will seated. Good morning. Did that cheer you up a little bit from that dreary rain this morning? 
give him a big hand. Good morning. My name is David. I want to welcome you to Union Church this morning. We're glad to have each and every one of you here. We're going to continue with praise and worship in just a few moments with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements, but I do want to welcome those of you that are visiting with us this morning. We are certainly glad to have you, and uh, we want to welcome you here. If there's anything you need or anything we can do to help you out, please let us know. We'll be glad to do that. If you're a first-time visitor, this is the first time that you're coming to Union, we're glad to have you here, and we've got a free mug for you. If you'll stop by the information desk, you can pick up your free mug. Also, if you've been coming with us for a while now and you like one, they're on sale, so you can pick that up for $10. And again, those are at the information desk, so we want you to pick that up if you're new around here or if you'd like to purchase a new one. Also, when you first came in, you might have received a Connect card, and what we like to do is we like to make a connection with you, and that's what this card is all about. So we ask that you fill out some basic information, just tell us a little bit about you, and in turn, we'll get back in touch with you and tell you a little bit about us. So if you'll fill out that front form of the uh, Connect card and drop it in the offering bucket when it comes around in just a few moments, uh, someone will be back in contact with you, but we do appreciate when you do that. If you'll take a look at the back of it, it talks about your spiritual journey, and we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. Also, serving at Union, if you've been coming for a while and you'd like to step up and serve, lots of different ways you can serve. We need helpers bad in all different areas. For you see those folks out here wearing blue shirts, they're helping in the children's area. And then you also see folks back there that are wel welcoming people and making coffee, and then we also have those that clean and Lots and lots of different ways to serve. So maybe if you've been praying about it and you're looking for a way to serve, check off one of those and we'd love to get in contact with you about that as well. I do want to tell you about some upcoming events that we have going on starting today. After our 11 o'clock service, we have our new Around Here Lunch. Now, if you've been visiting with us for some time and you've never participated in one, we want to invite you to that. It's going to be in our lobby area back there. It's immediately following the 11 o'clock service, and you will be served. Food is free. Uh, just come and, and gather around, and we'll get you set up at some tables, and we're going to have some great food and great time of fellowship. And again, that's coming up after the 11 o'clock service. I uh, also want to tell you about a couple of other things that are upcoming. Uh, we're going to be meeting about baptism. We're going to be having dunked coming up in just a couple of weeks. We're really looking forward to that. We're going to do it on both the 9 and the 11 o'clock services. And uh, if you are a candidate or ha maybe you've been praying about it or considering uh, doing baptism here at Union, we'd love for you to do that. We would love to help you with that next step in your spiritual journey. We're going to have a meeting this morning back there in the new around here room, and we'd love to meet with you and talk with you and tell you a little bit more about what baptism is all about. So we're going to do that this Sunday as well as next Sunday following both services. So if you're a candidate or have been praying about it and you'd like to speak to someone, we'd love to invite you to come on back uh, right after the service and talk with them about that. Also, I want to tell you something awesome that I, I heard about, and I, I'm friends with Wade and Wendy, great people. I couldn't tell you two better people that are leading our middle school group, they had 19 kids come out on Wednesday night. Amen. 19 kids. And they're going to be back there in the new around here room as well to meet with you. If you're a parent and you've got kids that are in the middle school group range and you would like to know a little bit about what they're doing on Wednesday night, they would love to meet with you immediately following the services. So Go on back there and meet with them. But that is awesome, 19 kids. I had originally heard 20. I had originally heard Wade say that there was 20, but he, picked, he actually counted in one big ugly kid by mistake, and that was my son Josh. So anyway, lots of people helping back there, but we do appreciate all that come. And also want to let you know something exciting as well. Our youth group is going to be kicking back up. And Dustin Dickens, uh, we like to call him Duck around here, he's going to be back there as well to meet with him if you'd like, uh, if you have kids that are in the youth group range, or maybe you're a youth yourself and you would like to know a little bit more about the youth group, that's going to be following both services as well. So we've got all that going on today, so lots of great things going on. And again, I mentioned that we are having our baptism on October the 11th. Now that, uh, that kind of coincides with something else that we've got coming up. We've got a membership class coming up on October the 4th. So on October the 4th, our membership class, Adam leads that. And it begins at 5 o'clock. Dinner and child care are provided. So maybe you've been 
thinking about joining the church, maybe you're thinking about membership, you don't know everything that you need to know, this is a great opportunity. Since Adam leads the class, you can ask him any questions that you might have. You do not have to join. It is no obligation. It's just a class for you to learn more about the membership here at the church. And so uh, we invite you to come out for that. And again, that is coming up on October the 4th, 5 o'clock, dinner and child care provided. One other announcement that I don't think we have a uh, slide for. Coming up on Saturday, October the 3rd at 8 o'clock, we're going to have our men's breakfast. So we will have our men's breakfast here at the church next Saturday. So if you'd like to come out for that, there is no cost for that. It is free. It's eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, juice, coffee, and milk. It's a great time of fellowship. We do a devotional. We pray together. So I'd invite all the men to come out to that. Again, that is next Saturday morning here at 8 o'clock. Invite anybody you'd like to come. We always have a great turnout, and we always have a great time of fellowship together. So I invite you to come out for that. In the meantime, we're going to pray as we get ready to go into our worship service uh, just a few moments. So pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for this day. We're thankful that you have given us another opportunity to come to your house to praise and worship you, Father, because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, we lift up to you all of those folks that are here this morning, and Father, the burdens that are on their hearts, the prayer requests that they might have things that are going on in their lives that maybe others don't know about. Father, maybe they've come to you in prayer, maybe not. But Lord, we are thankful that you are all-knowing, that you are all-powerful, and that you are willing and able to help each and every one. And Father, I just thank you for this time as we come to you in praise and worship. Lord, I thank you for the singing we've done this morning. Lord, I thank you for that drizzly rain out there, Lord, but it's bright in here. And Father, the sun always shines, and we are thankful for that. He lives today. He continues to save, Lord. And I pray that you will instill that message in us today. Now, Father, we take a moment to give back to you our tithes and our offerings, Lord. And I say back because it was already yours to begin with, Father. We're following in obedience to give back to you what was already yours, Lord. May you use it in a great and mighty way, both here and around the world, in your name. Father, I just thank you again for this opportunity to praise and worship, Lord. I pray that you would be with each and every one here this morning, those that are serving. Father, I lift up Adam this morning as he comes to prepare a message for us. Father, I pray that it would touch the lives of those that are here. May the Lord be with those that couldn't be here this morning. And Father, I pray that you'd bless each and every household. I ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. coming through you'll notice that there's some uh, flashing going on over here um, Dylan called that earlier our Pentecostal holiness section so um, welcome anyway we're glad you're here there's nothing we can really do about it right now or it won't be until after church is over with the completely today anyway so it just is what it is last week uh, you'll notice I, I don't know if you pay a lot of attention to stuff like this you notice this is not my typical preaching table I've had the same one for almost the whole existence of the church last Sunday after church came back in two o'clock or so Decided not to flip on the lights, thought I could find my way upstage um, in the dark. I found my way, and then I found my way falling off the side of the stage, grabbing this preaching table, it ripping and tearing stuff off. Anyway, that was last Sunday, and so, um, uh, yeah, that's a little different. We got some lights flickering, we got some air out downstairs, we got some rain outside, and really doesn't make a whole lot of difference, um, because uh, I will tell you that... Uh, that what I would like for us to talk about today, we're in, we're in our third week of um, the hardest thing you'll ever do. And, uh, and I think that there's specifically a message meant to be for you today. And what we're, kind of what we're going to dive into, I think, is, is obviously, obviously, 
um, making the devil mad at us. So um, we're just going to do real I just need your help, okay? So the real quick this morning, we're just going to say bring it on together. One, two, three, right? Is it, can we do that? It's 9 o'clock in the morning. You look sleepy. Lights are flashing. It's raining outside. I need your help. Let's do it. Ready? So one, two, three, we're going to say bring it on, all right? And don't, and don't wimp out. Don't be that dude that sits there, oh, you seen a crip, right? All right. <laughs> Let's go. One, two, three. Bring it on. There we go. All right, all right, awesome. All right, so, so um, hardest thing you'll ever do. Week three, uh, we've been talking about through this series is, is asking for help. Week one, we talked about the fact that um, you've got to worship instead of worry. Last week, we dove into a very, um, I would say, generalized approach to pride and how it will basically strangle the life out of you. Um, and so this week... Um, I, I want to talk about a little bit, I want to go a little bit in a little bit different direction. We're still talking about the fact that the hardest thing you'll ever do is to ask for help. Um, but let's, let's just start off like this. Most of you would say, I think all of us would say in the room that we love someone or something, right? Like if I made you be like, you know, made you do the church thing that I do to you every week, made you raise your hand and said, do you love someone or something? Uh, most of you would be like, uh, well, yeah, I, I love someone or something, right? I mean, you love someone or something. And so you're going, Adam, of course we love, I mean, I, my wife's right here. If you make me answer that question and I don't say yes, I'm in trouble, right? My kids are downstairs. I mean, you know, I got people, I got family. And so, of course I love someone, but um, let's, let's look real quick at a few things that I personally love. Let's look at the first one. Here you go. And I think most people love these things, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought would happen. Everybody goes, oh, puppies, right? Now, um, I'm going to get to something in a minute about this, but I think most people, most people love puppies. And if you're not a puppy lover, um, then you're probably a cat lover, which means you're weird. And so, um, anyway, <laughs> um, most people, now, even if you don't want the puppy, right, for yourself, even if you don't want to clean up the doo-doo and all that stuff, uh, most people like puppies. Let me show you something else that I just love. I'll, I'll show it to you real quick. I think most people love it, too. <laughs> Look at that bad boy right there. I'm just a grill, like a good grill. And see, some of you are going, I don't particularly like grills. I bet you like it when we grill stuff on it, right? <laughs> and then if you're like, well, Adam, I'm more of a tofu person. Uh, well, that means more steak for me, so thank you. And uh, God bless your little heart if you love tofu. Anyway, all right, moving on. And here, here's another one, number three, number three. I showed you some pictures last week, too. Look some pictures. Most people, like, love this, too, right? Right? I mean, did you, all of you just immediately went, oh. Gosh, to be able to sit there with my toes in the water, right? To be able to have a cold drink and no kids yelling, right? Just laying there and it's warm outside and the sun's beating down me and I don't even care if I'm fat hanging out <laughs> in the sun. <laughs> you, know, you, you know you're comfortable at your vacation when you could give a rip what's hanging out, you know what I mean? Like, that's when you really come. So ladies, you go on vacation, and all you worry about the whole time is, oh my gosh, I'm so fat this year, I can't do this, let me, let me cover up, uh, then you're not vacationing, all right? At some point, you just, that dude, that dude, that one dude that walks down the beach in them skimpy little Speedo type things with stuff just jiggling all out of, the, that dude is having vacation. <laughs> he is vacationing. He could care less what you think. I, I, those are some things I love, and I think there are probably some stuff that we all love, but um, let me just say this. Love, love is determined by what we are willing to seek out and sacrifice for, right? Seek out and sacrifice. Love is determined by what we are willing to seek out and sacrifice for. And see, we say we love stuff, and, I, and like we say we love those things right there, those pictures, or you say you love certain things. I, I want to I wanna push in on you for a second because I want to say you probably don't really love those things. You might like them, but I don't know if you really love them. Let, let me prove my point. So that first picture that we threw up um, was of uh, a puppy, right? And that particular puppy is a golden-haired Tibetan Mastiff, right? Now, you're going, Adam, how do you know that about dogs? No, I don't. I had to practice real hard to be able to say them words to you just now. Um, and that particular puppy, that exact puppy, the puppy in the picture, follow me, the puppy in the picture, that puppy cost, somebody paid about two million bucks for that puppy. Most expensive puppy ever sold. Now, do you love puppy? 
or you just kind of like puppy? You see, love is determined by what we are willing to seek out and sacrifice for. Somebody loved puppy a lot because they were willing to seek out, go find that ugly puppy. And uh, see, now I say he's ugly. Earlier it was all cute, right? Seek out and then, and then uh, sacrifice for. Now, now the second one. Um, now, I love this thing. Like, I, I thought I did. I thought I loved it until I saw the price tag. This is a $35,000 grill. Now, just so you know, I would cook my hot dogs over a lighter from the, from the gas station before I'd spend $35,000 on a grill. It looked good, though, don't it? Right? It's got refrigerator built into it. It's a Bluetooth grill. You can look at your grill and say, own. <laughs> That's amazing, right? Do you like it, though, or do you love it? Do you love it? I don't think so. Who wants to spend $35,000? If you want to spend $35,000 on that grill, I know a family in our church who is in desperate need of a grill. Adam and Valerie Cook, 2801 Rees Mill Road, Sutherland, Virginia, 24594. They just like it or you love it because love is determined by what we are willing to seek out and sacrifice for, what we're willing to go get and pay the price that it takes for us to love it, right? The third one, um, this one will get you real quick. See, most of y'all were like, if I could just wake up every day, I would just, you know what, I'm moving to the beach. There's about, I bet there's at least half of you in here that said this at one point in time. I'm just moving, right? I don't care. I'll wait tables at Uncle Gus's Seafood Palace or whatever. And, and you know, I just, I'm going to the beach. I'm living there because I just want to wake up every day and look at that view. I don't know. I mean, you might, I, you, that view right there um, is from Richard Branson's, who's the dude that owns Virgin Atlantic, all that crap. And is a guy who's about to fly up into space personally. You know what I'm talking about? Weirdo guy. Um, awesome, but weird. Um, it, it, this is from his private island. Um, to stay at this island, and it's a very small island, by the way, to rent the whole island um, is $357,000 for five days. Five days. Five days. Now, look at that. Look at that thing right there and do what I said when I saw that. I have to step up here to see that screen. I'm, when you look at that now that I said that price tag, then you're going, well, ain't nothing wrong with a little Myrtle Beach. Some pretty good views. Valerie and I drove our um, a two-year-old, when Olivia was two, a long time ago, we got in the car and we drove all the way from here to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, all the way out, all the way there. And uh, it took us, counting traffic, 24 hours in the car, nonstop with a two-year-old to get there. And when I got there, I looked at them beaches and I thought, uh... I could have went to the Outer Banks, right? Because there wasn't nothing wrong with it. It looked beautiful. It looked great. But it just wasn't, I, I don't know. At that point, I'd realized, ah, I just not, I don't love this. See, love, when we love something, when we really love something, not just when we like it, we're willing to seek it out, we're willing to go get it, and we're willing to sacrifice for it. And see, when I say or when we say around this church all the time that God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, some of you have a problem with that. You do. You won't say that you do, because that would make you a bad church goer and Christian, right? But deep down, somewhere inside, a lot of you, when we say God loves you, you've got a problem with that, because you don't think that God necessarily loves you. You, you have an issue with feeling and knowing that God loves you, and I think that it's keeping you back. Some of you are pushing back going, this message ain't even going to affect me because I know that my Jesus loves me. I posted it on Facebook 12 times yesterday. Every time that, that little thing said, share me, and I, you love Jesus, you were like, I do, I do, I do. <laughs> and then you forwarded it to me in my inbox, and I never replied back to you. You were like, Adam, don't love Jesus. <laughs> Let me give you two reasons that people doubt, that, that almost everybody at some point in time, two reasons that people doubt God's love for them. Number one is uh, past sin. Some of you have, um, some of you in the room, you have a great testimony, right? Like you grew up in church, like you could have been, like some of you, you were, it feels like you were born in church, like your mama birthed you, you were conceived in church, born in church, right? Then you were birthed in church, then you grew up in church, you lived in church, you got ordained like 15 minutes after you were born, you've just been a super Christian ever since. 
Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, like, that's a good thing. Like, I want my daughter and my son and my future daughter or daughter on the way or daughter to be or whatever you want, daughter in the oven, right? I want them to have that testimony. Like, I want them to have that good testimony that's like, you know what? Uh, I've been in church all my life, and I have never, ever doubted. Like, Daddy, there's never been a time that I doubted that Jesus loved me. Like, I want that testimony for my kids. Some of you have it. Very few of you, though. Most of us, however, that's not your story. That ain't your story. As a matter of fact, there was a whole lot of stuff before Jesus that you ain't proud of. Right? Like, before Jesus came into your life, you're not proud of a lot of the mess that you've done or been in or been done to you or whatever. And see, when you hear that God loves you and you look back on who you were, you doubt that he really loves you because you can't get past your past, your past sins. And you walk in here and you'll pretend real good, you know, you do all the stuff you're supposed to do and but deep down, back in the bottom of your soul, what's probably keeping you away from God is that you don't really believe that he loves you, and the main reason is, is your past sins. They make you doubt it. Now, number two, not just past sins, but uh, present circumstances. It's not what I did, it's what I'm doing right now. Now, see, we create a church where we are very fond of talking about and laying out our dirty laundry. Some of you picked up on this real well because you lay it out there for us like crazy. And we like it. One of the main reasons why I talk and preach the way I do is to make sure that you know my mess and I know yours. That this, this is not a um, let me teach the crowd what I know, right? It's let us learn from God what is true together. And see, some of you, it's not what you did, it's what you're doing right now. And, and you're saying, I'm not sure he loves me because of the way I'm living right now. The way I'm living and pursuing my life right now. Outside of this moment, like right now, if I could dive into your soul, you'd be like, outside of me coming to church this morning, I ain't doing so hot. All right? And I showed up this morning and I bathed. Thank you for bathing. Appreciate that. I showed up this morning and I cleaned up, but the way I'm living my life right now makes me doubt whether or not God loves me because I don't feel like I'm real lovable in my current situation and what I'm doing right now. See, maybe the biggest thing that's, that's keeping you from asking for, for help from me, from your church, from your family, from, from God specifically, the help that we are told in the Bible that can only come from the risen Savior Maybe the thing that's keeping you from doing that is you don't really believe truly and understand that he loves you and the depth at which he cares for you and loves you. And we're going to dive into the Bible this morning. It's going to be on the screens, and we're going to go through a lot of Scripture, so i got to hurry up. And so um, last week we were a little light on the Scripture, and I talked about it at the very end. This week we're going to talk about a lot. And so what I want to do is I want to look at um, a couple verses from Matthew several verses from Luke, and then some more from John, and then we're going to um, round out and hit the home base with some Romans, okay? So what I want to do is I want to go through that, and we're going to talk, talk about John today, um, John himself, not John his book, John himself. And before we get going on that, and you keep that whole love thing in the back of your mind, because it's going to take me a little while to get back around to it. Does that make sense? And you ain't really awake anyway, and so can we flash some more lights? Okay, no, don't flash some more lights. All right, so anyway, some people in the back going, no, I'm about to have a seizure, all right? So, um, <clears throat> so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, right? So the, in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? If you don't have a Bible, by the way, we will give you one or 12 or however many we got left on the way out, okay? Go back and stop and pick one up. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the first four books of your New Testament. Those are known as the Gospels in the Bible, and they are accounts of Jesus' life, right? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written in about 50 to 60 A.D., all right, when we say A.D., whoever told you this in school that it meant after death is wrong, okay? Because if it meant after death, then before Christ, then there'd be 33 and a half years that we don't know anything about, right? So what it really means is, is in the year of our Lord, okay? So in the year of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Um, and so 50 to 60 or so after Jesus' birth. So how many years or so after his death? Somewhere between, you know, 15 to 20, 25, somewhere around in there, right? And so Matthew, Mark, Luke were written at that time frame. You got me? All at the same time frame. This is one of those great things where you can dispel the fact that people question the validity of the Gospels. Because when you know that it was actually written that few years after Jesus' death, and then the fact that it would have never got out of the first century if it was false, right? Never would have got out of the first century if it was false. And so you see Matthew, Mark, Luke written that early. And then the book of John, though, right, which is the gospel that I absolutely love, right? There's something about the book of John that's amazing. If you are in here today and you're going, I don't, I don't read my Bible at all, i got to pretend right now. No, no, you don't, first of all. Use your concordance if you need to find something. If anybody around you looks at you weird and gives you one of them weird church looks because you just look something up, Right? You know what I'm talking about? Where they go, oh my God. He doesn't even know how to use this Bible. Slap them in the face, please. Huh? Oh, you think I'm joking? Oh, all right. We got people that will do that. That's their job. That's what they serve. They do. They knock some self-righteous people out. Um, I'm going to get to you in a minute if you're self-righteous. So, y'all thought I was joking. Anyway, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 50 to 60 A.D. Now, John was written in about 80 to 90 A.D., so follow me. So that was written... A long time after Matthew, Mark, Luke. So what that means is, is that means that John, who wrote John, knows and has read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You follow me? So the thematic themes of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John would have known and would have read, and he understands himself. Does that make sense? Right? And then he ends up writing the account of Jesus from his perspective um, and now, six times, six times. Now, anybody got anybody in their household who's the repeater? They repeat stuff constantly? All right, so just so you know, in my house, I'm the repeater. I got it from my mama. She's on the front row. My brother calls her repeat, okay? <laughs> just so you know. But I and my family, I'm the repeater. I'm the one that will say 15 times in the morning, put shoes on, Right? Matter of fact, I have this really bad habit of my kids not listening to me. I just say it over and over and over again until they just go, stop! Right? I'll, I'll look at Libby and I'll go, put shoes on, and she won't say anything. I'll go, put shoes on, put shoes on, put shoes on, put shoes on, and then finally they just all lose it. Will you shut up? I'm like, how about you just put your shoes on? Right? <laughs> Works by what? Anyway, that's bad. That's a bad parent, and I know that I'm screwing them up. My prayer is just to screw them up, you know, not that bad. You know what I mean? Um, parents, if you don't know this, you're going to screw up your kids. It is true. You're going to screw them up, some way, shape, or form. Just we try not to screw them up so bad, right? Just a little screw up. Um, where was I going? Oh, yeah, so six times, six times, repeat, six times in the book of John, six times, John calls himself the one who Jesus loved, right? I'm the one who Jesus loved, right? I try, it's weird. It's weird. When I read this, when I look at it, I go, that's strange. He's a weirdo. The one who Jesus loved, right? Go, you, Thanksgiving's coming up. Try that out. Go to Grandma's house. Hey, guys, I'm the one who Grandma loved. <laughs> see how that works out for you, right? I mean, see, walk around today after church. Now, don't do this because then you're going to probably have a Union Church T-shirt on and everybody's going to think we're weirder than we already are, okay? Um, I think we finally killed that cult rumor um, by moving out of the dark building. That's what everybody called it, right? But it'll come back in some way, shape, or form. But, but when you go out to lunch today, try it. Right? Coach people like, hi. They'll be like, hey, how you doing, Matt? Good to see you. Oh, yes, my name's Adam. I'm the one who Jesus loves. Try it out. You're going to, it's weird. Strange. Strange. Like, I read this and I go, what is he talking about? John says this six times. Six times he says, he, he says about himself, he names himself the one who Jesus loved. It's weird, right? It's a little strange. So let's dive into looking at John and then we're going to get to what he was talking about. So, uh, Matthew 4, 18 through 22. That's where we're going to start off at. <clears throat> Let's take a look at it. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, really important, we're going to come full circle all the way back around here in about 15, 20, 30, 45, about an hour. We're going to come right back around uh, to, some of y'all got that, but the welcome team was in the back going, mm-hmm, that's right, I know, about an hour. He's going to come. Around. Anyway, so uh, Sea of Galilee, real important. And Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Look at the next verse. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Some of you are going to say, that's supposed to say fishers of men. Same thing, okay? 
I'll send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. What does that mean when they left their nets? They left them in the water, by the way. They just gone. Anyway, next verse. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Zebedee is an awesome name, by the way, just so you know. If you look up something to name your kids, uh, Zeb couldn't be a better name, all right? Because if they're a redneck, they can be a Zebco. It's amazing. Anyway, moving on. None of y'all got that. Nobody fishes. John, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, the one who Jesus loved. That's what we're going to start doing for the rest of this message. Anytime you see the name John, you're going to put in the one who Jesus loved, right? They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, also named, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, look at the last verse, 22, and immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. Now let me give you some historical context real quick. So back then um, the school system was quite different than it is now for us, quite different, right? Uh, boys went to school when they hit a certain age. Girls did not. And so boys went to school, and what they went to school to learn was the Torah, specifically back then the fi first five books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, right? So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? Those first, first you, we're looking at the four books of your New Testament today. I'm talking about the five books of your Old Testament. So they went to school, and they learned it. They memorized it. They were required to memorize it. Some of you are going, there ain't no way. My kid can't even memorize old McDonald's. Right? Well, that's probably because they're glued to the flipping TV all day long. I, moving on. That has nothing to do with the message. So they had to memorize it. And then when they hit about fifth, sixth grade, right, middle school, we talked about it today, right? Our middle school ministry um, has only been running for several months. Um, and Wade and Wendy Hopkins are here. Wade is in the back somewhere. Wade's right there. Raise your hand, Wade. Thank you. There he is. Wade runs our middle school ministry. Um, so fifth and sixth grade middle school age of these kids. Basically, the, the kid is about to hit the armpit of life. You know what I'm talking about. Middle school is the armpit of life. It, it, it stinks, man, like literally and figuratively. <laughs> so they hit about fifth, sixth grade, and um, guess what happens? They determine then, they look at them, and the religious system of the time looks at them and decides who's good and who ain't, like who can proceed on and who can't. Like, what kid did a really good job of it that you could continue on, and what kid didn't? So if you did, you continued on, and you became a religious leader, right? And if you didn't, then you went back home, and you did what your daddy does. That was your only option. You follow me? That was it. You went back home, you did what your daddy does. You see this vicious, a vicious cycle that happens with this, Right? where, well, obviously the daddy ended up coming back at some point and being a fisherman too, when we're talking about James and John, Peter and Andrew. And so you come back and you become what your daddy did. So it basically means that the religious system rejects them. Now, hold up, hold up. Jesus was a what? Anybody know? He was a carpenter. So that means at some point, Jesus himself, as a child, was rejected by the religious system of the day. Don't ever think for one minute that if we follow Christ, like we're supposed to follow Christ, that the religious system of our day won't reject us. Don't ever think it for a second. It comes hard every day. You know, we get criticized every day. You know where it comes from? Church people. It never comes from somebody who doesn't know Jesus. So, that's where we pick up John. What, what is it? He's been rejected by the religious system, and he had to go back home and fish with Daddy. I want you to stop for just a minute and think that if you were required to, if you had to go home and become what your dad became as a young age, how would you feel? Like most people would be, I mean, you know what I mean? How do you go from not knowing who Jesus is at all to writing a book about him? Like John goes from not knowing who he is at all to writing a book on him. You, you, you follow him every day. You see, some of you are in here going, Adam, I don't know nothing about, I'm, I'm just trying to follow Jesus. I don't know nothing about the Bible. I didn't grow up by this. I, I, I don't know anything. Well, how do you go from not knowing him well to knowing him well enough to write a book on him? You follow him every day. If you follow him every day, I'm going to promise you right now that he's going to blow your mind. He'll blow your mind. 
He blew my mind today. This is a stressful morning. Okay? Let's just, I'll just lay my hand out there. Stressful. Stressful last night. Stressful day before. I get a message right before I come up to preach from somebody who never says this to me, who says, hey, look, I don't never have dreams, but I had a dream about you killing it on stage today, so kill it. And I was like, thanks. You know, I'll just brush it off. You're weird. And so um, it's the best, one of my good friends. Then I get, I get a message about He's like, no, I'm not kidding you. I would go to sleep. I'd have the dream again. Uh, and then I'd go to sleep, and I'd have the dream again. That never happens to me. Like, you were, you were preaching the word like crazy today. Get on it. Jesus will blow your mind like that. But you follow him every day. If you don't know him well now, don't let that stop you. John didn't even know who he was. So we pick up on John, uh, who has been rejected by the religious system. So he's the one who Jesus loved, and he's been rejected by the religious system. You follow me? See, some of you in the day, when I say rejected by the religious system, you know exactly what it feels like. Because somebody chewed you up and spit you out in the church. Let's move on to Luke 9. Got a lot of scripture to cover today. I ain't doing too good. Luke 9. We're going to be in verse 49 through um, about 56. We're going to just look at 49 and 50 right now. And then we're going to jump uh, up to Luke 22. Then we're going to get on to the book of John. I promise I'm going to get there. So, Master said John, the one who Jesus loved, was someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop them because he is not one of us. Master said John, somebody was driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he wasn't one of us. Right? That's, that's strange, by the way. That's a strange sentence. Just, this is the one that Jesus loved, by the way, saying this. Next verse, verse 50. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. John, the one who Jesus loves, basically looks at Jesus and goes, hey, I did something really good. Pat me on the back. I did something real good. Well, real good for the kingdom. There was these people, and they weren't like good Christians. They were just kind of like Christians, and, and they didn't go to my church, so I stopped them. And Jesus looks at him and goes, shut up, right? That, that's stupid. If they're for me, then what's the difference? They're not against me. Like, in my name. Do you read the same as in your name? He was casting out demons. Like, Jesus rebukes him. He's going, he's going, hey, pat me on the back. Pat me on the back. Let me tell you something. See, self-righteousness, it always gets a rebuke from Jesus. Always. Jesus always rebukes self-righteousness. And let me tell you something, especially when it's falsely done in his name. Be careful. Be careful when you decide that you're going to be self-righteous as a Christ follower. It always gets a rebuke from Jesus. So we got, we got John, the one who Jesus loved, right, deciding that he wants a pat on the back, that he's all that in a bag of chips. Right? I ain't used that statement in a long time. That's old, right? That's the bomb. Anyway, moving on. Verse 51 through 56. Let's read through these. As the time approached for him to be taken up from, to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Following along? All right, let's keep going. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Awesome. Look at verse 54. When the disciples, James and John, the one that Jesus loved, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? What? Verse 55 and 56. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. So John, the disciple, the, the one that Jesus loves, basically runs into a problem. And the guy's like, hey, we got an issue. They don't like us. And John goes, hey, let's kill them all. <laughs> hey, guys, hey, hey, I'm the super Christian here. I know what to do. We're going to murder them. <laughs> That's the one that Jesus loved, by the way. All right? John, the one who Jesus loved. And Jesus basically looks at him and goes, no, fool. Not going to kill him. Right? I mean, that's the, the one. So the, basically, the one who Jesus loves wants to kill and annihilate an entire village. Now, this is, this is me. This is, on, this is the only time my plan is to kill everybody in sight is when I am on... Um, uh, Kentuck Road, 729, going through the new obstacle course. Um, 
There's an awesome American Ninja obstacle course coming through Kentucky School. I don't know if you know this or not. Um, it's, it's like Jeeps made it and stuff. It's got big holes. And, I mean, it's amazing. I drove through it this morning. I'm not kidding you. I can't go slow. So when you drive through big, humongous holes and gravels and stuff going fast, you're like this. Right? And I'm sliding through. The only time I want to kill everybody is when them people driving on that gravel are going one mile an hour. Right? That's when I go, hey, God, can we go back a little bit to Luke 9 for just a second? Can we annihilate them? So Jesus, John, the one that Jesus loved, you follow me? John, the one that Jesus loved, wanted to annihilate an entire village. Skip to Luke 22. <clears throat> this is verse 24. I'm going through them fast, so if you've got your Bibles and you don't turn fast enough, just write it down and come back to it. A, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Now, we're not going to look at the prior scripture of this or the after. I'm just going to tell you what the story is. That was Luke 22, 24. Right before this, Jesus basically opens up his entire life and heart to his followers. And he's about to die for them. And so he basically opens up everything he can possibly open up and sets up communion, holy communion with them. And he tells them what's going to go down. He basically pours his heart out to his friends. Don't miss that. And then the first thing they do is Luke 22, 24. They argue about who's greater than each other. They're like, oh, it's great and all, Jesus, that you're going to die and all, but can you tell us, like, who's number one in your circle and who's number two? Like, who's got it going on? Can you, can you let everybody know that I'm a better Christian than uh, this guy over here because my dad's name is Zeb and that's a cool name and stuff? So, like, can you, you know, you got them immediately looking at each other and deciding that they're, they're just selfish. You see the selfishness? I mean, this is selfish. Jesus looks at them and says, I'm about to die for you. And they go, awesome. Um, who you like better? Which one you dying more for, you know? I mean, it's crazy. And then Jesus gets arrested, beaten, dragged around, flogged, trialed. All those pieces. And John, scriptures say, is watching silently in the background. And he is, um, he's cautious when he should be courageous. He hides in the back. He doesn't say anything. He keeps his mouth shut. He's cautious when he should be courageous. See, some of you, this is exactly where you are. You're being cautious when you ought to be standing up and going, no, nah, hold up. If you're going to kill him, kill me, right? This is one of them moments where dudes just step out and go, no, uh If you got a problem with him, you got a problem with me. Like, this is where John ought to be going, hold up, hold up, you know? Whatever is going down, this is not happening on my watch. If you're going to kill him, you're going to kill me. I know him, I love him, I follow him. And see, he steps back and he's cautious instead of courageous. Jesus, John, the, the, the one who Jesus loves, the one that Jesus loves, if you've ever wondered if God loves you, if you've ever wondered about his love for you, I want you to watch this scripture we're about to look at. John 21. Now we jump to the book of John. John chapter 21. Now this is the one that Jesus loved writing. Let's look at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. So he's been resurrected and he comes back. Don't miss this. So that basically means that he was in the grave and he was gone and he was dead. Now he's back. Verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, or T. Diddy, like I like to call him. <laughs> Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee. Hold up. The sons of Zebedee. Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John, the one that Jesus loved, Right? Don't miss this. James, John, the one that Jesus loved, is in this crowd. And two other disciples were together. So John's there. You got it? The one that Jesus loved. Verse 3. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now stop right here. What did they do? Jesus is gone, and they're back to fishing. 
you don't miss it because it's crucial. Jesus is gone. He's passed away. They don't know that he's resurrected, although he told them about 9,000 times it was going to happen, just like us. He tells you all the time that he's got your back, that nothing can hurt you, that you're sealed in his love forever and you don't believe it. But all of a sudden, John has gone back to what he did. John, the one that Jesus loves, has gone back to what he did before Jesus. You see, some of you are in that boat, literally. Like, literally, you are sitting in that boat right now, the boat that they were on, where they went back to their life before Jesus. That's you. There was a time where you accepted Christ. You were changing your life. You were moving in that direction. I don't care how long ago it's been. And then somewhere along the way, you have gone back to what you were doing prior to Jesus. Because that's what we pick up. Remember we talked about, they go back to, and they're not just going fishing. Like, don't read this verse and think, oh, well, they just needed to fish and blow off some steam. They're stressed. It's been a rough week. No, 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 no. These dudes are going back to what they did prior to Jesus. Right straight back to what he called them out of, what he changed them out of. They go right back to the labels that they held on to and that they had been placed on them by the religious group of the time and everybody around them. They go right back to who they were before Jesus. And some of you, you are in that boat. Like Christ came in, he changed your life. And somewhere along the way, you don't even know when or how, you went right on back to doing the same mess you did before Jesus changed your life. So, Jesus finds them. This, this verse is going to change the way you look at God loving you if you pay attention to it. So Jesus finds them gone back to the same stuff that they did before. He saved them redeemed them, set them aside, and put them to work for the kingdom. They went right back to it. You see what I'm saying? Now look at verses 4 and 5. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. This is a, such a telling verse. He's standing on the shore. They're fishing in the boat. They don't know it's Jesus. And some people say, well, it's probably far away. couldn't see. Yeah, I, Maybe. I know how they do this sometimes because I feel like Christ could be standing right slap in front of me and I don't even pay attention to him. But look at, look at the next verse, verse 5. He called out to them, what did he say? Friends. Have you anything that, haven't you caught any fish? Friends. Now I don't want you to miss this because when we read earlier they were in the communion table, and they were gathered around and he was laying his heart out for them. He called them friends. He calls them the same name when they're in rebellion as they are when they're in communion with him. Do you, you see this? Like you doubt that God loves you? He calls John, the one who Jesus loved, the same name as a friend that he called him when he was in communion with him as he does when he's in complete rebellion against what he said he was going to do with his life for Christ. Same name. Friends. See, Jesus, Jesus' love doesn't change. See, what, what love is, is it's what we're willing to seek out and sacrifice for. And see, John knew that he was the one that Jesus loved, not because of anything that he could ever do, but because he had been sought out and bought with a price, sought out and sacrificed for. See, that's what determines love. See, some of you, you're stuck in the fact of thinking that your love by God or whoever else is determined on you, what you do, how you do it, where you came from, what you got in your pocketbook, what you look like in the mirror and to everybody else. And I'm just here to tell you today that that is not the definition of love. Definition of love is, is what are you willing to say, seek out and sacrifice for? See, John knew that he was loved and he called himself, he boasts in the fact that he's the one who Jesus loved because he knows that no matter what I do, I'm the one that Jesus loved. He absolutely loves me no matter what I do or where I've been. He loves me. His love and my merit and my accomplishments, they don't matter together. 
because he loves me no matter what. It's not because he did anything. It's because he was sought out and he was sacrificed for. Now you look at those verses where he calls himself. You know what, actually, the next verse, and we're not going to look at it today, but if you want to look at it in your Bible, the next two verses, he calls himself the one who Jesus loved right after this happens. Because I think he gets it. Do you get it? Do you get the fact that Jesus loves you? That God's love for you is true? That once you have Christ, once you have Christ, he can't unlove you? So you don't, you don't believe me. You're like, Adam, if you had some scripture to prove that, maybe I'd believe you, but, but I don't believe you. Well, I got some. Let's look at it. Romans 8, 38 through 39. Good Christians in the room will know this verse really well. I said that, you know, as a joke. I don't think any of you are good Christians. Neither am I. Do you, you think that God can unlove you? But if you're in Christ Jesus... He can't. So if you're a Christian today and you have given your life and heart to Jesus, I want to show you that he can't unlove you. Look at verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, don't get caught up on the first part of it, because that's some beautiful language. Get caught up in the last part of it. What does the last part say? In the love of God that is in who? Christ Jesus. That is in Christ Jesus. Can, can God unlove Jesus? Just think about it for a second. then he can't unlove you. Because the love of God is in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus, then God can never unlove you. You following me? Because see, I think some of you were sitting here this morning to hear this message, and he can flash lights all he wants to, but all it will do is announce the fact that if you are in Jesus, you are loved. And see, some of you today, you are not asking for help. You will not pursue the help that you need, because you really, honestly, in your heart, you don't believe that he loves you because of your past or because of what you're doing right now. And I will tell you that if you are in Jesus, if you are a new creation in Jesus, if you're sitting there thinking right now, Adam, I'm not, we're going to work on that in about three seconds. But if you are in Christ Jesus, he can't unlove you because the love of God that can't, nothing can separate is in Christ Jesus. He can't unlove Jesus and he can't unlove you if you're in him. He called them friends in communion and rebellion. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know where you are today. If you're sitting in communion with God right now, or if you're sitting in rebellion, if you are in Christ Jesus, he calls you friends. I want you to pray with me this morning. Father God, right now in this church, I'd like for you to speak. There is no greater thing that we could do in our lives or as a church, as families, than to let somebody know how much you love them. God, I am absolutely nothing. I've walked through a bunch of mess, Father. I've caused a crap ton of hurt and pain in my life. I'm not from the greatest of families. The religious system doesn't appreciate me a whole lot. I make mistakes. I screw up daily. You call me friend. Right now, God, I pray to you that you would open up hearts right now because what I know, God, is there's some people in the room right now 
who don't know you as their Savior. They've never said it. They haven't accepted you. Maybe they've never been in a position where somebody just point blank asked them. So as you're praying right now, I ask you, Jesus is your Savior. Do you know him? Have you accepted him? Have you said outwardly? Have you acknowledged that he died to save your soul? Have you acknowledged your need for a Savior? Have you allowed him to take over your heart, your life, your eternity? If you haven't, I want to give you the opportunity right now to just accept Christ, to accept Jesus. All you got to do is raise your hand. You're raising it to him. You're not raising it to me. You raise your hand and you accept him. You just say, God, I, I need you. I, amen, I see your hands. <laughs> Keep them up. Because what he'll do right now is he'll change your life. He will come into the deepest parts of you and let you know that you are loved. You are loved like no other. You are forever and eternally loved. I will call you my friend. And all you're doing right now is you're acknowledging your sinfulness to God and his greatness. You're saying to Jesus, Jesus, you died on a cross for me and you came back from the grave for me. You rolled a stone back from my grave. You saved and sealed me forever. And he will blow your mind. Father God, the hands that are raised right now in this church, I ask you to just let them know. Let them feel that unending, unloved, Lord, that, that love that comes from you that never ends, never changes, never wavers, God. Lord, right now, I pray that you would just move over their lives. God, right now as a church, I would ask you that, that as they raise their hand to accept your salvation, God, that you would allow us to party, but you would allow us to come a, a, beside them and help them grow in God, that nothing is too embarrassing to talk about, that nothing is too out of the way, Lord, for us to deal with. Welcome them home. Thank you, Jesus. If you are here today and you're not a Christian, you just became one. Welcome to the family. If you're here today and you are a Christian, won't you come back? You're in the boat, ain't you? Like he saved your soul and you're sitting in the boat. You went back. You went back. You went back to what you were doing before he called you. Won't you come back home? As we pray today, as we wrap up, if that was you today, I want you to just come forward up here. Our prayer team's ready. They'll pray with you up here. There ain't no fancy schmancy altar of any sort. Matter of fact, you say there ain't no altar here. Adam, well, the altar is where God is. And I can tell you right now, he just saves souls. He's right here. You just come forward up here. You ain't got to pray with us. You can just pray. Welcome back home. Come back home. Father, we love you. We praise you this morning. Father, I pray that you stir in people's hearts, Lord that you are the ultimate, ultimate healer in our lives, God, that we are never too far away from you to come back home if we are in you. Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that you move on people's hearts, that they come forward this morning, and they would just pray to you that they come back out of the rebellion they left in, Father. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we lift up to you today. Amen.
Jesus, you. 